All right, Joel, one of the things that you and I talked about was how come if we see all of these benefits in soil health, keeping the soil covered, uh, having a live root in the ground uh, or, or as many days as possible, uh, minimum disturbance of the soil, and then diversity, diversity, diversity. And we've seen a lot of economic benefits from that. Why, why is there still so much resistance or maybe um, in, incredulity, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, towards some of the things that uh, are happening in the cover crop and soil health movement? What, one of the basic challenges, challenges is that agriculture has become very formulaic. Okay. It, it is remarkable how streamlined the process of corn and soybean production has become. Okay. But with the technology we have available today, we have farmers in this area that are farming 1,500 acres with one hired hand. And the man might be 65, 70 years old. Yes. And he, with the right mechanization and the right chemistries and the right guidance from the retail agronomists, one person who is 65, 70 years old with a hired hand that may only help, you know, during planting and harvesting can make it all happen. Right. And, and actually be amazingly efficient. Yes. But when you start adding in the complexity of biological systems, it becomes difficult for those formulaic systems to, you know, to work well because it's no longer formulaic. It, re it requires much more of the site-specific type of um, decision-making that precision agriculture is about site-specific decision-making, but so, so much of the precision agriculture that most people are aware of yes. is formulaic. It's just these formulas that are in a computer that decides how they're going to distribute an input at a variable rate across the landscape. Got it. And, and that's, that's impressive technology. But the, the decisions of how to put cover crops across the landscape in variable ways or how to adjust for weather that, you know, weather is the main driver of biology. So you just, you have to be very flexible in how you make these biological systems work. Um, that, you know, that's a key part of it, the, the inability to just use a formulaic approach if you are managing biological systems. And so the farmers that are excellent managers, some of them are just cut out, you know, they are cut from the right cloth to do this type of biological farming. Yes. And other farmers that are very good corn and soybean producers, it, it's, it's just a different way of thinking and so it, you know, it, it stretches them. The other aspect may be that the most important ingredient of these successful biological systems is the soil organic matter. And in soil management today, we have soil testing procedures that yes. tell us, do we have the right amount of the different inputs, gotcha. our phosphorus, our potassium. and we just have not arrived there with soil organic matter. We don't have soil tests that tell us you have the right amount of organic matter. We have tests that tell us you have 3% organic matter. And you can see trends upward or trends downward. But knowing that you have arrived at a level that maybe is sufficient so, such that you should focus your attention on other fields, because this field you've gotten it up to a high enough level, that's not something that we have a good handle on. So when, when we don't have these basic tools for guiding management decisions, it requires even more intuition and creative thinking by the farmers. And we have lots of farmers that can do that, but we also have lots of farmers that are very good at following the guidelines of, of tests. And yes. we, haven't, we haven't brought the soil organic matter test to the level that um, we, we have for the the other types of chemical soil fertility tests. Okay, so do you think there's a future in that? Is there is there research being done where we're looking at that kind of uh, 
being able to do that. I know, of course, you're not going to be able to spread soil organic matter on the ground, but are there ways that uh, you think we'll be able to make this more available to the farmer, uh, you know, the person who's doing all those acreages? Mm -hmm. uh, what's that direction of research going in? There, there are lots of interesting approaches to identify how much organic matter is enough. Yeah. And some of those approaches are based on a concept of carbon saturation, that a particular soil has particular mechanisms that stabilize carbon. Yes. And when those mechanisms are full or saturated, then additional organic matter is much more likely just to mineralize rather than to be retained. Okay. So a soil that is approaching saturation or is at saturation is not a soil where it's a good investment to add some more manure okay. or do as intensive organic matter management. Whereas soils that are highly degraded, yes. where the cup is mostly empty, where yes. you're way below saturation or some literature says where your saturation deficit is very high, that's where the organic matter will have the biggest, biggest benefit yes. and where it will be most retained. So your organic matter that you add to the soil will have the, you know, the, the greatest likelihood of building organic matter in the soil. So one, one basic approach in the carbon saturation um, research world is to look at the fine mineral fraction of a soil, the, the silt and yes. the clay, yes. and principally the fine silt yes. and the clay. And th those fine mineral particles, they complex with organic matter. Yes. And so there are different ways of looking at this, but basically about um, somewhere in the range of, of five to 10% carbon can be retained on the surfaces of the fine clay fraction. Five to 10% carbon is much higher than we see as the total carbon content of most soils. Yes. But most of the carbon in most soils is on the surfaces of the fine fraction. Okay. So a soil that has very little fine fraction, a very sandy soil, has much less capacity gotcha. to protect the carbon yes. on the fine fraction surfaces. Yes. So soils that have high fine fraction should have higher soil organic matter contents. And soils that have lower fine fraction should have less. And so right. that's one guideline. You can do a test for how much fine mineral material, how much material is less than two, mi sorry, less than 20 microns, microns in size. And then there are relationships between the quantity of less than 20 micron fine fraction yes. and how much carbon can be retained. Okay. And if you That's are- That's almost like sort of the cation exchange capacity. It, it is very similar to that idea. And some yes. people are even looking at measuring not just the, the mass of fine fraction. Like, you know, we talk about a soil having 20% clay. Yes. That's a mass relationship. Yes. We also can measure how much surface area is in the soil. And so a, a clay like the clay in these soils is going to have a high surface area. Might these have, are smectitic? Th th these are smectitic or two to one clays right, right. that have surface area internally and externally. And so they might have 80 to 100 square meters per gram of clay. <laughs> Whereas if you went to North Carolina, the kaolinitic clays might only have 10 right. square meters per gram of clay. Yeah. So that surface area is really where the organic matter is getting stabilized. Okay. So not all clay is the same. Right. And so a soil with 20% clay here should stabilize more carbon than a soil with 20% clay in North Carolina. Okay. So th those are some ways to think about it, but there also are some, some other powerful tools that allow us to measure organic matter more rapidly. Yes. Such as there are on the fly sensors where you drive across the field and you actually are sensing organic matter optically. Yes. Basically based on color. Color. As you go across the field. Yes. So you can map organic matter, not just one sample every 
several acres, but rather you're sampling many, many times per acre. Okay. So that gives us an intensive map of, of organic matter. We also have some tests of the active fraction of organic matter, and the NRCS is starting to use a uh, purple permanganate test. Have you? I've, I've heard. Seen of, that? I think you told me that one. And now is the Haney Brinton test as well the, that, the CO2 a, burst test? That's another test. When soils are dry and then rapidly Re-wetted. wetted, yep. they there's a burst of microbial activity and CO2 that's released is is from organic matter that is most easily digested. Okay. And so the, that's another example of an active fraction test. And the active fraction is what feeds the microbes. It's yes. also what most recently was crop residue or, or cover crop residue or microbial biomass or earthworm biomass. And so it, the active fraction is most sensitive to your recent management mm-hmm. and it also is most um, conducive to feeding a, an active soil biology. So that's your set, your energy, your immediate energy source. Your yeah. energy, your nutrients is right there in that active fraction. So, you know, in terms of new testing methods, I think we need to look at methods related to how much can the soil hold. That's right. the saturation concept. Right. We need to look at methods that measure the part of the organic matter which is most important. Yes. The active fraction, and we need to look at methods that can be done with more intensive sampling because if you're only pulling samples that are coming from you know one or two places per field it, it's difficult to to really see what's happening yeah yeah okay well that's uh, th- that gives us a little bit of insight and and hope you know that uh, I guess what what we really want to do in this series is sort of talk about the science behind this and you've given us a really good insight and maybe some of the avenues that uh, cutting edge researchers are looking at. Mm-hmm. I would really love to see what you're doing on your farm but before we do that I just wanted to say thank you so much Joel for speaking with us. It's really been a pleasure. It's been a learning experience as always for me. and. Uh, why don't we go and look at your soils? Or at least look at your uh, look look at what you're doing on the plot. That would be great. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right.